Good morning, everyone. It's not quite 930 yet, so I'm going to wait a few minutes. Hopefully some more students show up. Good morning, everyone. For those of you just signing in, I'm going to wait one more minute. It's not quite 930 yet. I don't want to start early because I want to make sure everybody has a chance to log in and get their audio going. So I'm going to start in, in about one minute. Okay, it's 9.30, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So as always, I will start class with a couple reminders about due dates and various things. Your first reading assignment for chapters 1.1 through 1.4 was due this morning as of right now. If you did not complete your reading assignment on time, please contact me after class ASAP as soon as possible. Um, because this is part of your grade, it's an important part of your grade going forward, and I want to make sure everybody starts off on the right foot. Okay, so if you did not complete your reading assignment, if you're watching this recording or you're here live right now, please contact me after class ASAP. Upcoming due dates. Okay, so your next reading assignment, which is chapters 1.5 through 1.6, is due on Monday at 9.30 a.m. I will leave the instructions up in the start here folder. So if you're wondering how to do it, there's instructions. There's not only instructions on the actual taking of notes, but also how to submit. So I do not accept JPEG files. I only accept PDF files. And your PDF files should be, it should be one file, right? It shouldn't be 14 different PDFs. It should be one file. There's instructions again in the start here folder on not only how to do the actual reading assignment itself, but on how to stitch those files together and to submit as a PDF. So again, your first reading assignment was due this morning at 930 sections 1.1 through 1.4. If you did not complete that assignment, you need to contact me ASAP. Your next reading assignment sections 1.5 through 1.6 are due on Monday. Also due on Monday is your course ticket, your course ticket 1.1. It is in D2L. 
in the unit one folder. So if you go into D2L, click on unit one, at the bottom, you should see a bucket called course tickets. Okay, so that's your first course ticket. It is also due Monday morning by 930. So again, you have two things due on Monday, reading 1.5 through 1.6 and a course ticket. The survey that I posted in my initial announcement is due today. Hey, it's a five minute survey. It literally, it should take you no more than five minutes to complete. It's just about STEM courses in general, your mindset, you, the resources we offer. It's not, a, it's not a chemistry content survey. Okay? The link for that is in my original announcement on D2L. That is due today. Um, Sunday night, you have your first homework assignment due. I believe it's 1.1 and 1.2 maybe. Um, I'd have to go on Cengage to look and see, but your first homework assignment is due Sunday night at 11.55 p.m. There are instructions for registering for Cengage if you haven't done so already in the Start Here folder. There is a link in the Start Here folder to purchase Cengage. If you use that link that I posted, it will cost you $40. If you purchase from the Georgia Highlands bookstore, it will cost you $80. Okay. If you purchase directly from Cengage, I want to say it's something like $100. Please don't do that. Please do not purchase directly from Cengage unless you have multiple courses using it and you want to purchase the unlimited option. But again, your best bet is to purchase from me. Purchase the link that I posted in the Start Here folder. It'll cost you $40. There's a 14-day free trial, so you cannot come to me on Monday and say, yeah, I didn't do the homework because I couldn't buy that the, the access to the system. There's a 14 day free trial. You all will have access to the homework system. So please register for homework. It's due Sunday night. Okay. All right. So that's it for upcoming assignments. And let me show you my, I'm going to share my screen here. So let me just show you one more time how you see what's due and when it's due. If you go into D2L, so if you go here to D2L, go to your content, okay, click on course schedule, click full schedule, you will see when your next assignment is due as well as a link to that assignment. So there's a link to the Dropbox for the next reading, which is due on Wednesday. There's a link for Monday's reading assignment and the course ticket. And as soon as class is done, I'll make sure to also get the link up there for the homework that's due on Sunday night. Okay, so again, you've got three assignments coming up. You've got a reading, a course ticket, and a homework. The reading and course ticket are due on Monday at 9.30 a.m. The homework is due on Sunday night, okay? And again, there is a survey that is due today. It should take you less than five minutes to complete. The survey is linked right here, okay? So upcoming due dates, everybody good? Everybody okay on those? Yes, ma'am. Awesome. Okay, so now we're going to switch in to do our actual lecture material. I just want to tell you guys, once I switch over to my PowerPoint screen, I will not be able to see the chat function anymore. So if one of you that has a microphone could just stop me and let me know when there's a question in the chat box, that would be really awesome. Because once I, once I switch into my PowerPoint and I put it full screen, I won't be able to see that anymore, okay? So and I don't care who, whoever has a microphone, if you could just let me know when there's questions in there. And if you do have access to a microphone, rather than typing your questions in the chat box, can you unmute yourself and ask? Um, because it's, like I said, it's really hard for me to do the PowerPoints and see the chat at the same time. Okay, so let's go on ahead into our PowerPoints here. We're going to start with chapter one. Okay, start with chapter one. And so the first thing that I want to say before we get to the actual chemistry material is that you guys are all brand new to this subject. I'm going to go out on a limb and assume none of you have an advanced degree in chemistry, right? You're probably all, even if you had it in high school, you probably don't remember everything you learned. Right? This is new material to you. So we're all going to be respectful of each other, okay? We're all going to be respectful that everybody's learning a new skill here. There are no stupid questions, right? Do not be embarrassed to stop me and ask me questions. This is not my lecture, this is your lecture, right? This is where you guys are coming to learn the material. So if you have a question, I, I need you to feel comfortable asking it, right? I don't want you to feel like, well, my fellow students are gonna think I'm an idiot if I ask this question, okay? Because 
you're new to this subject, right? I mean, we all laugh at this, right? Where is the press any key to continue? Where is the any key? To you and I, that might seem like a really silly question, right? Because we've grown up around computers, cell phones. But when it comes to chemistry, you all are not chemistry experts. So there is no stupid question. I can still remember sitting in biology class and general chemistry my first year of college and wondering if a cell was bigger than an atom, like trying to picture in my head. And it wasn't until later that I, I learned that cells were made of atoms, you know, millions and millions and millions of atoms. And so I was able in my head to finally understand that atoms were obviously the smallest things on earth, right? and that cells were made of atoms so they were clearly much larger but i didn't want to ask in class because i didn't want to be seen as an idiot right i didn't want to be that dummy who didn't know you're not going to be a dummy right if you don't understand a concept as i'm talking about it i need you to tell me and ask for help okay i don't care what anyone else in the class thinks and neither should you but i can guarantee you that nobody else in the class is going to think that you're an idiot because if you have that question chances are really good so do they okay so please, let's all be respectful of each other. And when you need help, please, 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 you know, don't feel embarrassed to ask for it, okay? It's a tough subject. Chemistry is not easy, right? And anybody that, that tells you going into this class, oh, it's a piece of cake, lied to you, okay? It's a tough subject. So let's all, let's all get through it as best we can. Okay, so learning outcomes. These are the things that when we're done with this chapter, you should be able to do. Right? Things like describe the scientific method and differentiate amongst a hypothesis versus a theory versus a law. Um, be able to provide examples telling the difference between macroscopic versus microscopic versus symbolic. Can you describe the basic properties of each physical state of matter? Distinguish between mass and weight. Can you classify something? Like if I give you an example of matter, could you classify it and then define it and then give examples? Could you identify properties? So if I gave you a property, could you tell me whether it was physical or chemical? Could you tell me whether the property was extensive or intensive? Um, could you explain the process of making a measurement and tell me what the three basic parts are? Could you describe the properties in units of length, mass, volume, density, temperature, and time? Um, at the end of the chapter, can you perform basic calculations and conversions in the metric system and between the metric system and other systems? Can you tell me the difference between an exact and an uncertain number? If I give you a number, could you identify it? Um, could you correctly represent the uncertainty in a measurement using significant figures and the rules of rounding? Can you explain dimensional analysis and how it works? Can you use dimensional analysis to carry out unit conversions for a given property and computations involving those properties? So hopefully at the end of this chapter, the answer to all of that is yes, yes, I can do all these things. Now, does anybody know why or want to take a guess at why I have the first, what, seven of those are in regular font and the bottom five are in bold? Anybody want to guess why I did that? Is, um, is it because we already covered that from the other reading assignment? Yes, that's exactly. You're the first person to ever get that right on the first try. Most people usually say because it's more important, right? It's not got anything to do with importance. So generally, the ones that are not in bold are the sorts of things that you guys should be gathering from the reading, right? These are your mostly conceptual things, right? Things like understanding the scientific method and being able to describe it. That's the kind of material you're gonna spend time on in your reading and in your notes. Things like using dimensional analysis to, to complete a unit conversion that's the sort of thing we're going to spend our lecture time pretty extensively on. Okay, we're going to spend a lot of time on how to do dimensional analysis. So the conceptual things describe, explain, classify, right? Those are the things that you're going to mostly get from your reading. The doing things, right? Use, represent, perform. Those are the things that we're going to spend the majority of our time in class because those are the harder things for most students to do, right? The bottom ones, the ones in bold, those are the applications, right? That's where we take what we've learned and we actually do things with what we've learned.
learned. Whereas the first seven things on this list are the learning part, right? They're the learning the, the basic terminology. They're the learning of the concepts. So generally speaking, 90% of my lecture is going to be focused on these bottom five in bold, right? And only maybe 10% to 20% is going to be focused on the conceptual pieces because I want you to, to gather that from the readings. Now, that isn't to say that you might not have questions, right? So let's say that you're doing the reading and you're having a hard time distinguishing between microscopic and macroscopic and symbolic domains, right? And you've read the material and you still don't understand and you're, you know what, I need help with this. Where do you go to get that help? Anybody? You could type it in the chat box if you want. Where do you go? Where, where did I tell you guys you could go to get help with understanding the material in the class? The 411 place. Yep, STEM 411. So let's say you're at home and you're like, you know what, I gosh, I'm just, I'm really struggling with this concept and I know we're going to have class and I know we're going to use this. We're going to start applying these concepts. I need help. What am I going to do? Well, you're going to click on that STEM 411 link and you're going to go to either a live chat with a professor, my, myself or one of the other professors and get help understanding that concept. Or if there's nobody available to live chat with you, you're going to put in a ticket so that you can get some help. Okay. And if the first professor who answers you doesn't answer to your satisfaction, doesn't give you an answer in which you really, really, truly understand, respond to that response. You can keep answer, you know, you can keep going back in that ticket and say, I still don't understand. Okay. This is really, 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 I can't stress this enough, guys. Don't struggle alone. Okay. If you don't understand a concept, we need to make sure that you're getting help. Okay. The other way besides STEM 411 is to form study groups with each other. Now, I know this is an online class and none of you have your cameras going right now. None of you can see each other. It might seem really impersonal right now, right? You feel like you're not really in a classroom because all you can see are people's names up, like you can't see faces. I really strongly encourage you guys to get together with each other. Um, you can use the Remind app. Um, you can use um, GroupMe. Um, you can use... Um, I'm trying to think there's several apps out there that will allow you guys to get group chats together. Um, form study groups, right? Help each other out. If you're not understanding a concept, maybe your classmate is. Okay, so again, the stuff, the first seven learning outcomes that are listed here for this chapter are all things that you should be getting from reading your textbook, you know, learning the material. We're going to focus on these bottom five, but that doesn't mean you can't get help if you don't understand these concepts. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started on, on the actual material in chapter one, now that we know what we're gonna learn. Oops. Okay. Okay, so one of the most important, am I doing the right one here? Okay, one of the most important things that we're gonna learn about in chemistry is measurements. Pretty much all of chemistry is measurements, right? I mean, it's, you're going to use measurements to gather various information, but the actual chemistry itself is all based on, on measuring things, right? How much mass do I have? How long is this thing? What's the volume? Um, and so it's a really important in this chapter for us to talk about how do we make measurements? What sorts of information are we going to get from our measurements? And why on earth are the sciences, chemistry, physics, biology, um, geology, why are they all so obsessed with the metric system, right? Because if you've taken any science at all before, you know that all measurements in the science world are done in the metric system. Okay, okay so law of conservation of matter. This is important because when you make measurements, right, sometimes it may appear that you've lost something, right? For example, when you weigh something, right, in a weigh boat, if you measure out a substance and weigh it in a weigh boat and then you pour it into a different container like a beaker or um, a flask, it might appear like you've lost some of it, right? It might weigh less in the second container than it did in the first container. Well, the answer is that it really doesn't weigh less than it did, right? What has happened is, is that you've lost some somewhere in transition from one container to the next. Because the law of conservation of matter says that you cannot destroy matter. Right? You cannot destroy it. You can change it. You can alter its state, but you cannot destroy it. Okay. 
So we always say, well, how would you explain it to a second grader? You know, basically, no matter what happens, right? If whatever you had at the beginning, you will still have that same amount in the end, right? Even if you're looking a little bit banged up and beat up, right? No matter how big the bang, right? you still have the same amount of stuff before as you do in the end, okay? You might lose some along the way, but you didn't destroy it, okay? Okay, so now that we know that we can't destroy it, let's talk about how we classify it. There are basically two types of matter. There are pure substances and mixtures. Pure substances are things like atoms. Okay? There are also things like compounds, right? For example, oxygen, um, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, water, uh, methane, right? Compounds are also classified as pure substances. So what do we classify as mixtures? Okay. Mixtures are things that are not chemically bonded to each other. So for example, if you take a teaspoon full of sand and dump it in water, right, the sand and the water are not going to chemically interact. You're still going to have discrete sand particles and water particles. Okay. Um, if you take a teaspoon of sugar and dump it in water, the sugar molecules are not chemically interacting with the water. They're dissolving and they're dispersing throughout the solution, but they're not chemically bonded. So in the two previous examples I gave, sand in water and salt in water, one of those would form what we call a heterogeneous mixture and one would form a homogeneous mixture. Anybody want to take a guess? The sand and water. Is that going to be a heterogeneous mixture or a homogeneous mixture? What do you guys think? I think that would be heterogeneous. Heterogeneous? Yes, you're both right. It's heterogeneous. Now, if you stirred and continue to stir, you could probably get it to look sort of homogeneous, but the second you stop stirring, the sand is going to settle to the bottom and it becomes heterogeneous. What about the, uh, the, sorry, the sugar in water? What do you guys think that would be? Uh, that would be homogenous? Yep, that's exactly right, homogenous. Because you get, so the, what the real defining factor is between heterogeneous and homogenous is whether or not you can visibly see regions of difference. So if you can look at something and it looks exactly the same throughout, you can't see any regions of difference, it's homogenous, homo meaning same, so same throughout. If you can see clear regions of difference, like when you mix oil and water, for example, or sand in water, um, if you can see clear separations and or large regions of difference, that's a heterogeneous mixture. Hetero meaning different, okay? So again, you can usually look at a mixture visually, and if you can see differences, you know what kind of a mixture it is. Now let's talk physical versus chemical properties. Okay. A chemical property is something that really only becomes evident during a chemical reaction. So the flammability of a chemical, um, its reactivity. So for example, when you guys go in the lab and you're working with chemicals, you might see labels on the bottom, on the bottle, talking about the various reactivities of the chemicals that you're utilizing. For example, is it an oxidizer? Um, is it flammable? Is it highly reactive? Um, those kind of chemical properties are labeled on the bottle. And then we have physical properties. These are things that we can see or observe without doing anything to the substance that we're looking at. So for example, color, mass, Right, you can weigh a substance without physically, or sorry, you can weigh a substance without chemically changing it. You can look at it and see its color. You can measure its density without changing it. Those are all physical properties. Okay. Now, physical properties are separated into two categories, extensive versus intensive. Extensive properties are those that don't change, right? If you have two samples of a substance, the extensive properties of that substance are identical in both samples. Intensive properties, on the other hand, do not change with the amount of matter present. So an extensive property is something like the mass, 
right? So I can have a shot glass full of water and a swimming pool full of water. If I weigh the water in the shot glass, it's going to weigh different than the water in my swimming pool, right? The water in my shot glass is probably only going to weigh a few ounces. The water in a swimming pool is going to weigh hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Okay, so that's an extensive property. Um, volume, how much space something takes up. Again, that depends on the amount, right? The more stuff you have, the more space it takes up. So a chunk of a teeny tiny chunk of gold versus a huge chunk of gold, right? The teeny tiny chunk of gold takes up less space than the large chunk of gold. So volume changes depending on the amount of your substance. Things like color, right, that does not change no matter how much of it you have, right? The color of a chunk of gold is the same whether it's a teeny tiny little nugget or a very, very large chunk, right? So intensive properties are things that don't change depending on the amount of stuff you have. Um, things like density, um, melting point, right? those are all things that don't change based on your amount. So those are intensive properties. And we can use those to identify the substance because they don't change. Extensive properties, on the other hand, since that changes depending on the amount, you can't use it to identify what kind of a substance you have. So remember, intensive properties you can use to identify if you have an unknown substance. Extensive properties you cannot. Okay. All right, so now we need to start getting into the actual measuring process, right? And in order to do that, though, we first need to talk about what do we do with really large or really small numbers? Because our measurements that we're going to make are sometimes dealing with really, really huge numbers or really, really small numbers, okay? And so what do we do with them? Well, you're going to be using your calculator to make a lot of calculations with the measurements that you make. So we need to know what to do with these numbers because you don't want to have to type in 16 zeros in a calculator, right? So if you're dealing with a measurement of, you know, um, 335 billion, right? You don't want to have to constantly type six, eight, nine zeros in your calculator. So what do we do? Well, we're going to use scientific notation. And we use that to put really large or really small numbers into a usable format. Um, particularly for your calculator, but also if you're just doing like quick math on uh, with pen and paper, right, same thing. You don't want to write 16 zeros down, okay? So how do we do that? This is going to be a brief, brief review here of scientific notation, okay? If you're still stuck on scientific notation, I've got some longer videos on the subject, but brief review here. The first thing you're going to do is move the decimal point from wherever it is until it is just behind the first number that isn't zero. Okay, so you're reading from left to right, right? You're gonna move your decimal point until it's right behind the first number that isn't zero. Okay, then you're gonna count how many places did you have to go to get there. That is the value of your exponent, okay? If the number that you're putting into scientific notation is smaller than one, the exponent should be negative. Okay, and that means that when you're taking your number out of scientific notation, you would move left. Okay, if the number you're putting into scientific notation is larger than one, then your exponent should be positive. Okay, and again, when going out of scientific notation, you would move to the right. So how does this look? Let's say we have this number here and we want to put this number into scientific notation. We're going to take that decimal point and we're going to move it from where it is located right now till it is immediately behind the first number that isn't zero. So we have 0 0.00000000356. So the first number that isn't zero is that three. That's where I want to move my decimal point. Okay. So drawing, you know, just kind of following along here, drawing along, I see that I had to move my decimal point nine spaces to I could get it from where it was originally located till it is behind that three, okay, nine spaces. So my number is going to become 3.456 times 10 to the nine. Now remember on the previous slide, we said that if the number was less than one, right, if it was smaller than one, i.e. if we started with zeros, my exponent should be negative. 
So to put this number into scientific notation, the number is going to be 3.456 times 10 to the negative 9. 9 is the number of spaces that we moved, and the exponent is negative because the number started with a 0, right? We had a number smaller than 1. It started with a 0. Okay, so now what we're going to do is you guys are going to take a few minutes and you are going to put these numbers into scientific notation. Oops. Okay, you can, I can't see the chat, so if you want to chat amongst yourselves and get help and check your answers, um, go ahead, talk to each other, you know, go ahead, like I said, you know, type in the chat. I can't see it right now. So just take a few minutes. I'll give you guys, I'm going to set my timer for three minutes. Go ahead and see if you could put all these numbers into scientific notation and then we'll talk about it. Set my timer here, which I forgot to have up and running. Timer. Okay. Do three minutes. If you're watching this as a recording and you're not here live right now, please take a few moments and, and attempt the problems. Don't just watch. If you guys finish early, could one of you let me know? Because I can't see the chat box. So if you guys all agree on your answers and get it done, let me know. Okay. All right. So who wants to be the spokesperson? Go ahead and tell me what you guys got for the first one. Anybody? Yes. Can you hear me? What'd you get? We got uh, 3.456 times 10 to the negative ninth. Four, five, six. Am I looking at the wrong examples? Oh, I'm looking. I'm doing the wrong one. Sorry. It's a three three point three five times ten to the eighth. Awesome. Yes, that is exactly correct. Three point three five times ten to the eighth. Because we move the decimal point. It's not visible in this number, but it's at the end of the number, and so we moved it. There were six zeros plus the three and the five. 
Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, um, what'd you guys get for the second one? Well, 1.33 times 10 to the negative second. Yes, exactly right. 1.33 times 10 to the negative two. Perfect. Okay. All right, who wants to take a stab at the third one? Not 9.93 times 10 to the third. Awesome. Yep, that's exactly right. Awesome. I'm so glad to see we're doing well. The next one's a little bit tricky. Anybody want to take a stab at that one? Yes, I got 1.35 times 10 to the zero. Yeah, that's exactly right. Because we're not moving the decimal point, right? The decimal point is already at right behind that first number that isn't zero. So we moved it zero places. So the exponent is zero. Awesome. That's exactly right. Okay, and who wants to tackle the last one? Um, 8.88 8. 8. 8. 8 times 10 to the negative fifth power. Yep, exactly right. Awesome. So it looks like you guys are, you guys are on top of things. Perfect. Okay, so again, if this is a topic you struggle with a little bit, you know, I know most of you probably had some of this in high school, but if you didn't and you're struggling a little bit, I do have scientific notation um, example videos up in D2L. So if you're struggling, aside from STEM 411, there's also some little short videos on how to do this, okay? But awesome job so far. Okay, so now that we have tackled how to actually write our measurements, let's talk about when you go into the lab and you actually make a measurement, right, whether that's using a ruler or a scale or a beaker, right, or a burette, right, what information are you going to get from these measurements that you're making? Because again, a big portion of, of any kind of science is that hands-on making measurements. And what information do you get from those measurements? Well, there are three important pieces of information that any measurement will give you. And this is true whether you yourself made the measurement using a ruler or whether you used an instrument with a digital readout that gives you the measurement. Right? So for example, if you step on a bathroom scale, right? it tells you exactly if it's digital right it tells you exactly what you weigh well you yourself didn't make the measurement the instrument did but it's still a measurement okay and so it will still give you these same three pieces of information so the first important piece of information is the size or magnitude right i.e how big or small is your measurement right you can get an idea of size just from the number value itself, right? Obviously, if you have a number value of 0 0.0051, right, that's a lot smaller than a number value of 145,000, right? So again, you can get an idea of the size or magnitude of your measurement just by looking at the number. The next important thing is the standard of comparison or the unit. Now, this is probably the most important piece of information in any measurement you're going to make. So I will tell you right now, in any exam, any quiz, right, any assignment that you turn in for me, if you do not have the units next to your measurement, it's automatically wrong. For example, if, if you guys ask me, hey, professor, how far away are you from the campus, and I say 40, that has no meaning. What do I, 40 what? 40 minutes? 40 miles? 40 inches? Like, what does that mean? So you need to have a unit attached to any number in, in, in any sort of measurement or numerical value in chemistry, because that tells you what I'm talking about. There's a big difference between 40 miles and 40 minutes, or 40 inches and 40 miles, right? If I live, you know, if I'm 40 inches away from campus, I'd be there in a minute. If I'm 40 miles away from campus, you're going to be waiting for me for a while. So again, standard of comparison or the unit, really important. I will nag you endlessly and drive you nuts about your units. You always want a unit attached to the number. Okay. And then finally, the third piece of information that you get from a measurement that maybe isn't readily apparent right away is the uncertainty. 
And the uncertainty tells you what is the difference between the true value and the measured value. Okay, so the uncertainty tells you essentially how much error there is in the measurement. And that is something that is not necessarily readily apparent just by looking at the measurement. Instead, we need a little bit more information. And we're going to come to that in a few minutes. Okay, but again, size or magnitude, standard of comparison, and uncertainty are the three pieces of information. Okay, that second one, the units are really, as I said, really, really important. And one of the things that it's going to be important for you guys to be able to do is to look at a unit and identify what property it's talking about. So, for example, mass, right? You need to be able to look at a measurement with a unit attached and say, oh yeah, that's a measurement of mass, or that's a measurement of length, or temperature, or volume, or density, or time, whatever. You need to be able to look at that unit and immediately identify what property it's referring to, which would be great if we were using the imperial system or the system that most of us probably grew up with, right? If you grew up in the United States, you probably grew up with miles and inches and gallons and pounds, right? Um, you probably grew up with Fahrenheit, right? It's 90 something degrees out right now. Those units, right, are not gonna help you because in chemistry, we do everything in the metric system. So you need to be able to look at a metric measurement and tell what property that's tied to. So for a mass, you're going to be looking at things like grams, kilograms, milligrams, right? pretty much anything with grams as the base unit is going to be a measurement of mass. And so when you see those units, you need to, your brain needs to immediately go, okay, that's a mass. I'm dealing with an amount of matter. Okay. Length. Again, in the metric system, we're talking meters, nanometers, centimeters, you'll be seeing millimeters, right? Anything with that base unit meters, your brain needs to automatically go, oh yeah, okay, I'm dealing with a length, a distance, how far? Okay. Time, thankfully, is the same all over the world, um, whether you're dealing with science or not, right? Seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks. Hopefully that doesn't require any work on your part. You can just look at that and go, yep, yep, time, got that. Temperature. Again, you guys are probably used to Fahrenheit, right? You know, you turn on the weather this morning and they said it's going to be hot, hot and humid. Right? It's going to be 90 zillion degrees out today. Okay. Celsius and Kelvin are, are, are really different, right? Celsius is almost unrecognizable from Fahrenheit. I know when I was a kid, we lived in New York. Um, my mom moved us out to the middle of nowhere, Medina, New York. Um, we did not get any radio except Canadian radio because we were in the middle of nowhere, New York. I can still remember the first time we got to the farmhouse and we turned on the radio and they said it was 23 degrees outside. And I looked outside and it was beautiful and I'm like, there's no way in hell it's 23 degrees outside. Yeah, that was 23 degrees Celsius. <laughs> Big difference. So even though your brain may not quite be able to make a connection between what a temperature is in Celsius and kind of what the equivalent is in Fahrenheit, or even worse, Kelvin, I still need you to recognize when you see it. Oh yeah, Celsius, that's a temperature. Kelvin, that's a temperature. Okay. Volume, how much space something takes up. Right? You probably are at least a little bit familiar with liters. Um, if you go into the store and buy, buy a bottle of pop, right? they sell it in two liter bottles, they sell them in one liter bottles. So you're probably at least a little bit familiar with the liters. Um, cubic centimeters is another common measurement of volume in the metric system. So again, liters, cubic centimeters, if you see either of those, you're dealing with a volume. And then finally, density is a ratio of mass to volume. So if you see a unit with a mass on top and a volume on bottom, then your brain should go, oh yeah, that's a density. right? So if you've got a unit of mass divided by a unit of volume, now we're talking density, okay? So again, please just familiarize yourself with these units and, and what property they identify with because it's gonna become important for you later on. Okay. Now that we're in the metric system, why in the world is the science world so obsessed with it? 
Well, the reason is that converting back and forth between units in the metric system is super easy. It's literally as easy as moving a decimal point, right? Just like it is with scientific notation. Move the decimal point to the left, move the decimal point to the right, move it to the left, move it to the right. Whereas converting between units in the imperial system involves multiplying and dividing by some really weird numbers, right? Like there's 12 inches in one foot. There's like 5,200 and something uh, feet in a mile, um, 16 ounces to a pound. Like it's really a pain in the butt. None of the units match and it's not easy to convert back and forth. So we went with the metric system because again, it's super easy. Everything's in powers of 10. So everything is to convert between one metric unit to another metric unit. We're literally going multiplying by 10 or dividing by 10. So we're moving the decimal point to the right or moving the decimal point to the left. Now, there is something called the King Henry method that's really useful for some of your most common metric system units. Okay, and what it utilizes is a phrase. Now, the phrase I learned in school was King Henry didn't usually drink chocolate milk. You may have heard something similar, something slightly different. Um, use whatever phrase works for you, but be comfortable using the King Henry method because you're going to have to do a lot of conversions back and forth between metric system units, between kilometers and meters, centimeters and meters, um, centimeters and kilometers. Um, so you just want to be comfortable doing it. And the way it works is that you write out the, the, the little phrase, right? King Henry didn't usually drink chocolate milk, right? And that K in King stands for kilo. Henry is for hecto, um, didn't is for deca, usually for unit, drink is deci, chocolate is centi, and milk is milli. And then what you're going to do is you're going to look at where you're going and where you want to get to. So if I want to know um, how many centimeters are in one kilometer, well, I'm starting here at kilo, right, and I am traveling one, two, three three, four, five spaces to the right. So to go from one kilo to centi, I'm going to add five zeros. Okay, five spaces to the right, I'm going to stick on my number five zeros. Okay. So let's how, see how this works with an actual number. How many decigrams in 42 decagrams? So again, I'm at deca and I want to get to deci. Okay, I'm at deca, I want to get to deci. That is two spaces to the right. So I am going to add, right, or take my decimal point and move it two places to the right. Essentially, I'm adding two zeros. So there are 4,200 decigrams in 42 decagrams. Okay. So again, using the King Henry method is just a really easy, easy way to convert back and forth between units. Um, I believe, I'm pretty sure there's also a video on this in D2L. So if you're still like, what? Right. Then definitely look that up. Or go on SEM411 and I'll help you there too. All right, now that we've made our measurement and we've been able to convert as necessary between the metric system units, let's talk about that last piece, right? That last piece was the level of uncertainty in your measurement, okay? So the way that we do this, remember I said you, you can't just look at a measurement necessarily and tell, right, how much error is in there. Well, the way that we identify this is to look at something called significant figures. Significant means important. The more important figures there are or digits there are in your measurement, the less uncertain or more precise your measurement is. So that error shrinks or expands depending on the amount of significant figures in your measurement. And again, significant means important. So the more important digits there are in your measurement, the less error right, there is in that measurement. So how the heck do you tell if it's important or not, right? Well, first, any number one through nine, so any number that's not a zero is immediately important. So if the digit is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, it's important. Okay. If it's a zero, well, then the, the answer is it depends, right? If a zero is important or not depends on what type of zero it is. And there are three types of zeros, okay? There are leading zeros. Those are the zeros that start off a number. 
So for example, in this first number, 0 0.00498, the 0, 0.00, right, those are all leading zeros. That zero, those zeros. All zeros that start off a number are leading zeros. Leading zeros are never important, okay? They're never significant. So when you're looking at a measurement, if your measurement starts with zero, right, that zero has nothing to do with the amount of uncertainty in your measurement. The next type of zero you might encounter in your measurement are captive zeros. Those are zeros that are between two non-zero numbers. Sometimes you might see them called sandwich zeros because they're sandwiched between two non-zero numbers. Okay, that's these guys here, right? Captive zeros are always important. So they always tell you something about the amount of uncertainty in your measurement. They're important, okay? They're always significant. And then finally, the last type of zero are trailing zeros. These are numbers that occur at the end of a number. Think like the caboose on a train. And the numbers at the end, the zeros at the end of a number are trailing zeros. Now, whether or not these are important to your measurement depends on one simple thing and only one thing. If your number has a decimal point, if your number has a decimal point, those zeros are important, okay? They count. If your number does not have a decimal point, those zeros don't count. Now, I wanna be really clear about this because this is the, the biggest mistake I see students make. It doesn't matter where the decimal point is, okay? It does not matter the location of the decimal point. It is only if. If there is a decimal point, then trailing zeros all count. No decimal point, no count. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at these numbers real quick and just see if we can identify the number of significant figures in the measurement. So looking at this first number, 0 0.00498. Okay. The first three zeros that are underlined here in red, 0, 0.00, those are leading zeros and leading zeros are not important. They never count. So we are only going to count the three non-zero digits, four, nine, and eight. That means that there are three significant figures or three important digits in my measurement. Okay. The next number, 0 0.951. Okay. The zero is a leading zero and does not count. So the nine, five, and one are the only numbers that count. That means there are three figures of significance, okay? Same thing for this last number, 0, 0.000000, right? None of those zeros count, only the six, the seven, and the three. So there are three significant figures in that measurement. Captive zeros always count. They're always important. So we have seven, zero, 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 six, one. All of those are important. So this particular measurement has six digits of significance. Okay. The next one, 1.092. 1 Again, the zero in the middle is important. So we have four significant figures. 8.4106. Again, the captive zero counts. So in that measurement, we have five significant figures. Okay. Now let's look at the last category, the trailing zeros. 821,000. Okay. In order to determine if those zeros are important, we're looking for one factor, and that is whether or not we have a decimal point. No decimal point, they don't count. Okay. So looking at this number, there is no decimal point. So the only digits that count are this 8, 2, and 1. Therefore, this number has three digits of significance, or three significant figures. Look at the next number, 8.21000, right? It's the same as the first number, but now we have a decimal point. So since we have a decimal point, all of those zeros are important. That means that we have six digits of significance, the eight, the two, the one, the zero, the zero, the zero, okay? 7.0000, again, we have a decimal point, so all of those digits count. So we have one, two, three, four, five digits of significance. 
Next number, 0 0.5500. The first zero is a leading zero. It's not important. The last two zeros are trailing zeros and they count if there is a decimal point. Well, there is a decimal point, so they count. So we have one, two, three, four digits of significance. The two fives and the last two zeros. Okay, all right, one more, 50.00, okay? All three of those zeros are trailing zeros. They all count if there is a decimal point, and there is. So all three of my zeros count, as does that five. So I have four digits of significance. So now you guys go ahead and try. There's some measurements. Go ahead and see if you can determine how many significant figures are in each measurement. And I'm gonna put three minutes on my, or two minutes, sorry, on my timer. You guys can talk to each other in the chat, okay? kind of go back and forth. But go ahead and see if you can answer. Okay. Did you, was that enough time or do you guys still need some more help or more time rather? Did everybody get through those? I think so. Okay. Awesome. Let's go through them real quick. Okay. Anybody want to take a guess at the first one? How many sig figs? Um, Four. Yep, that's exactly right. Four. All four of those digits are significant because that zero at the end is a trailing zero. Since there is a decimal point in the number, it does count. Awesome job. Okay, who wants to take a stab at the next one? I got six. That is exactly right. right? We have a captive zero and we have a couple of trailing zeros. The captive zeros always count and the trailing zeros in this case is count because of the decimal point. And of course, the six, the one, and the two count. So awesome, awesome job. Okay. All right. Oops. <laughs> I just accidentally revealed it, but how many in the next one? Three. Yes, three. Oh, you got lucky on that one. Um, the first four zeros are leading zeros. And remember that we don't count leading zeros. They're not important. Okay. And somebody want to take a guess at the next one? Three. Yep, awesome job to both of you. Three, yep, that's a trailing zero. We have a decimal point, so it's important. Hey, who wants to take a guess at the next one? One. 
Yep, exactly right. We have a trailing zero. We have no decimal point. So the only digit of significance is the nine. The zero does not count. Awesome. And who wants to take a guess at the last one? Five. That is exactly right. The first zero is a leading zero and does not count. The three zeros in the middle are captive zeros or sandwich zeros. They do count. Um, so we have five. Awesome job. Okay, so why in the world do you need to be able to look at a measurement and identify how much significance it has? Well, the reason doesn't really come from the making of a measurement. What it really comes from is what happens after you've made the measurement. So generally speaking in, in science, right, we don't make measurements just to make them. We usually do something with them, right? we're usually using that measurement to obtain other information. And so that's where this becomes important. Okay. Um, do you guys want to go through a couple extra examples or are you feeling comfortable? Don't be afraid to say you're not. If you want to go through a couple more, tell me. You guys could take a vote amongst yourselves. All right, you're not all quickly saying we're comfortable. So I'm gonna take that to mean that you guys maybe want a little bit more practice. So I'm gonna go ahead and set the timer. There's what, one, two, three, four, five, there's eight of these. So I'm gonna set the timer for four, uh, three minutes. I'll set the timer for three minutes and you can tell me if you need more time after that. Okay, I'll set the timer for three minutes. You guys practice these problems. And again, it's okay to, to talk in the chat or, or help each other out. Okay, 
How are you guys doing? Do you guys need more time or did you manage to get through most of them? I think we're done. Awesome. Okay, so let's go over them real quick. Anybody willing to speak up and tell me what they got for the first one? Um, three. Yep, that's exactly right. Okay, how about B? Four. Four. Yep, perfect. How about C? Four as well. Four. Yep, awesome job. How about D? Five. Five. Awesome job. How about E? Seven. Seven. I gotta count one. I gotta count one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven. Yeah, seven is correct. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't have that one written down and I had to count those zeros. Okay, how about F? Three. Three. Three, yep. How about G? Four. Four. Four, Four. awesome. And how about H? Four. 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 Awesome. Okay, you guys are doing great. That's perfect. Okay, so now let's, like I said, let's talk about, you know, why do we want to know how many significant digits are in a measurement? And so that brings us to this question, what happens when you use two different measurements to make a third? So the density of an object is a ratio of its mass to its volume. So if you want to know the density of an object, you need to, to measure the mass of the object and the volume of the object and then take the mass and divide it by its volume. Okay, so measuring mass is pretty easy, right? If you're in a lab, you might walk over to the scale, place the, the object whose density you want to measure on the scale and record its mass. And let's say that the scale says that the object weighs 22.434 grams. Okay, now you want to know the volume of the object. Well, if it's a liquid, then it's super easy because you can just pour it in a beaker and see, you know, see what the, the volume is. But if it's not a, a liquid, if it's a solid and you want to know its volume, we generally use the water displacement method because it's the most accurate method for irregularly shaped objects. So like, say, for example, I want to know the volume of my, um, that's not a good example. I want to know the volume of my marker here. Well, it's a little tough to get an accurate measurement of volume, right? Looking at this thing, it's not a liquid, so I can't measure it by sticking it in a beaker or a graduated cylinder. Um, although it's cylindrically shaped, it's not a perfect cylinder. It's got indents, it's got various spots on it that are not perfectly round. And so I could use the formula for a cylinder, but it would be an approximation. So my most accurate method would be to take a beaker of water, measure the volume of water in the liquid, drop my object in, the water level will rise, measure the final volume, right? Then take the initial minus the final, and that will give me the volume of my object. So again, to determine the volume of an object using the water displacement method, we're gonna subtract the initial volume from the final volume. And then once we have the, the volume, we can take that mass and divide by it. So in the problem, I started with 31.6 milliliters. I ended with 42.5. So the volume of my marker is 10.9 milliliters. The mass we recorded as 22.435. So now if we take the mass and divide it by the volume, in our calculator, we get 2.058256887 grams per milliliter. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that none of you, if I gave this question on a test, that none of you would actually write down 2.058256887 as your answer. If you got that in your calculator, what would you actually write down? Uh, it would just be 2.1. Yeah, so most of you would probably write 2.1. Some of you might write 2. Some of you might write 2.06. Some of you might get really wild and crazy and go, yeah, 2.058. Okay. But the real question is, is where do you make that cutoff, right? If, if we're taking that mass that we were given from our instrument and that volume, where is the appropriate cutoff? You know, is it two? Is it 2.1? Is it 2.06? Is it 2.058? Is it really 2.058256887? How do we know? Well, in science, we're really, really fond of rules, right? There are rules for everything. 
including rules for how to decide where you're going to make your cutoff. Okay. And the rules depend on what you're doing with your measurements. Okay. So whatever sort of mathematical operation that you're making, that determines where your cutoff is. Okay. So there are two pretty common mathematical operations you're going to do in, in chemistry with your measurements. So the first common thing you might do is multiply or divide. In fact, multiplication and division is the most most common mathematical thing you're going to do in chemistry all semester. Okay, it's, it's probably 95% of the math you're going to do in chemistry is multiplication and, and division. Okay, then there's also addition and subtraction. So here's the thing. If you're multiplying or dividing two measurements by each other, you want your answer to have the same number of significant figures as the number or measurement that had the fewest. Okay, so again, if you're multiplying two numbers together, you're going to look at both of those numbers and you're going to see how many sig figs were in the first number, how many sig figs were in the second number, and your answer should have as many as the fewest. Okay. And then there's addition and subtraction. When we're adding and subtracting, we actually don't have to know anything at all about significant figures. When you're adding and subtracting, instead you're going to look at the number of decimal places. So when adding and subtracting, your answer should have the same number of decimal places as whatever measurement had the fewest. So for example, we said we had our initial volume was 31.6. That has one decimal place, that's six. Our final volume was 42.5 milliliters. And again, that also has one decimal place, the five. So my answer, since my initial measurement had one decimal place, my other measurement had one decimal place, my answer should have one decimal place. So 42.5 minus 31.6 gives me a volume of 10.9. Okay. Now, when I put that into my formula, now I'm going to do multiplication and division. My top measurement has five significant figures. My bottom measurement has three. That means that my answer should have three significant figures. So what should I actually write down if this was a question on the test? 2.06. Yep, that is exactly right, 2.06. So my cutoff is going to be where that five is. And now because the digit next to the five is an eight, I would round up. So my answer should be 2.06 grams per milliliter. So again, whenever you're doing two or more measurements, right, and you're doing some sort of a mathematical operation, you need to determine what are you doing, right, whether you're adding or subtracting, and then you need to determine how many significant figures your answer should have. Now, I will say, again, the most common thing you're going to do in this class is multiplication and division. So you're going to want to get really used to looking at all your, your numbers that you have written down and counting sig figs in your head. Okay, that one's got three, that one's got five, that one's got two. Okay, my answer should have two. Okay, addition and subtraction, we don't do a whole lot of in, in chemistry. Again, mostly multiplication and division. And so then, you know, I want to just really briefly go over the rules for rounding because I know some of you, maybe it's been a while, right? Oops. Okay, I went too fast. <laughs> rules for rounding. Look for the number right next door. If it's five or more, raise the score. If it's four or less, let it rest, okay? Again, so you're going to look at the number right next to the number that your cutoff is. If that number is five or more, you go up by one. If that number is four or less, leave it alone. So in our previous example, we had 2.058. My five was my cutoff. The number right next to the five is an eight. That's five or more. So we increased by one. We raised the score, 2.06. If that number was instead 2.054, then we would have simply left it as 2.05. Okay. Um, I know in some textbooks um, and some lab manuals, they have all kinds of crazy rules for rounding if it's five. Like some of them say, if the digit after the five is even, raise it. If it's odd, leave it alone. Um, there's all sorts of crazy rules. I, in this class, we're just going to go simple, guys. If the number is five, round up. If it's less than five, leave it alone. 
Okay, I don't, I know again, some of you, some lab manuals, some chemistry textbooks go all kinds of crazy about rounding and they have all these complicated rules. Stick with this one. We don't have to, we don't have to go there. Not so you get to graduate level chemistry anyway. Okay, now we have, I have at the end of the slide here, a bunch of practice problems. Um, so what I can do, guys, we still have some time left in class. Um, we've got four minutes, actually. Sorry, thought we had more. Um, we can do this a couple ways. So I'm going to need you to talk to me here for a second. I know you're all shy. Um, in Zoom, there is a, such a thing as a breakout room, which is where I can put you guys in the breakout room when we're doing these kinds of problems. And you guys can talk to each other, and I won't be able to hear you. So if you guys want me to do that, um, next lecture, we'll do that. I'll put you in breakout rooms and you can talk to each other. And, and again, I won't be able to hear what you're saying. So you'll be able to freely talk about the problems and, and work out your solutions and come up with answers. Um, if you guys don't like that idea, then I can just leave you here like we've been doing. But I feel like it's been really quiet today and you guys are kind of not as willing to talk to each other because you know I'm listening. So what do you guys think? Do you want me to put you in breakout rooms in the next lecture so you can work the problems and, and talk to each other in smaller groups? And what do you guys think? Uh, yeah, I like that idea. You like that idea? Awesome, because I really want it to feel like a real class. If, if we were in a classroom right now, you guys would be in groups of three or four working these problems together. And I really want you, even though it's an online course, I want you to get that experience, right? I want you to feel like it's a face-to-face -face course, even though it's through Zoom. So if you guys are all willing, in the next lecture, when we start doing these problems, um, I will happily make sure to you know to put you guys in a private room and then what we'll do is when you're done you'll come back to the the main we'll come out of the rooms and we'll talk about the problems because we will always do that we will always talk about the answers we'll always go over them Tell like a plan mm, yeah okay so awesome so one more time for those of you that maybe showed up a little ways in i'm going to share my screen again really quickly guys because i want to show you how to access the drop boxes and submit your assignments because i got a couple text messages from some students okay so um first the 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 link for the for the lectures guys is always the same this is the same link as it was on monday the link is always the same as is the password so you'll always be able to find our lecture and then to access the drop boxes to submit your reading assignments and or your course tickets you're going to go here to course schedule then you're going to click full schedule okay here's how you access the drop box for your readings it's also the same spot where you access the drop box for your course ticket okay so this is where you go to to turn in the ticket to see the ticket itself to get the questions you're going to go to unit one course tickets down here at the bottom, click on it, and there's the questions. Now, you don't have to print anything out, okay? You can just write on a, on a piece of notebook paper, right, your answers to the questions, and then use your cam scanner app. So you don't have to waste the, your, your student money on your card for printing, okay? You don't have to print anything out. Hand write it on a piece of paper, use your cam scanner, snap a picture, and then again, to submit it, right, you're gonna go to content, course schedule, full schedule. And then if you click, where'd it go? If you click on this, it'll take you right to the Dropbox. Now I'm a professor, so it looks a little different for me, but you guys will see a spot right here to submit your assignment, okay? Homework, that's a different story. To access the homework, right, that's on Cengage. Once you have created your account, you click on this link here, Cengage, and that will take you to the homework assignment website. Okay. Homework is the only thing that's on a different website that's not on D2L. Okay. All right, before I let you guys go, any questions about upcoming assignments, due dates, um, any questions about the course itself, about what's going on, about the material, anything I can answer for you guys? Yeah, I have a question. Sure. How, are how are labs going to work? So la that's awesome. Labs are online. Let me share my screen again. The schedule, yeah. it, the schedule for the labs, if you go into content, there should be a lab tab down here. This is where all of the labs themselves are located. 
Okay, so this is where you'll find the, the various labs. And then the lab schedule is in the, uh, okay, maybe it's in the lab tab, sorry. Lab. No, did I not put a schedule up for you guys? I thought I did. Okay, I apologize. I thought there was a sample reading orientation. All right, I will post that today. Thank you so much for, for telling me. I didn't realize there wasn't a schedule up there. But the, uh, there will be a schedule with due dates. And like I said, you can access the labs themselves by going to the lab folder. Now there's this, I'm actually really glad you asked that because there's two types of labs in this lab folder here. So you see the ones that say PDF, PDF, Word document, those guys are paper labs that you will again, write snap pictures and put into a Dropbox. The ones that here that say external learning tools, if you click on that, it will take you, it's a simulation. You don't have to print anything. It will take you right to the lab. It will load up, you'll do the whole assignment. Um, it will automatically submit it for you. You will see your grade right away. Okay, so the paper ones, the paper lab reports, there will be a Dropbox in D2L. You will use Cam Scanner just like you've done on everything else. The ones that say external learning links or external learning tool, again, those you can click on. It will take you here to the actual lab. There's nothing to print. There's nothing to write on. There's nothing to take pictures of. You're just going to come in here. You do, the, you do the lab in here, and it will automatically transfer over to D2L. Does that answer your question? Um, kind of, but the last time I checked, I, I couldn't see the labs I needed to do. Like I couldn't see the actual labs. I so you saw... can't see this? Like when you click on labs, you don't right. see any of this? Right. Okay. I, after... I, just, I just see lab. That's fine. Give me a few minutes after class and I'll see if I can fix it. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else have any questions I can answer? I had a question about the lab simulations. Mm-hmm. Um, so you said that for homework, at least on Cengage, you have like a limited, well, like a lot of tries to get a good grade. For the simulations, is it like a one and done or do you get multiple tries for that too? Yeah, for the lab, it's a, it's a one and done. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. By the way, it will let you try it again, but it only counts your first attempt. That is, a, I'm really glad you asked that. It, the lab will allow you to make multiple attempts but it will only count your first attempt at the lab. Okay, so. Any other questions, guys? Don't forget this whole session was recorded, so I will be posting it on D2L in a few minutes so that you guys can all see it. Um, you can watch it as many times as you need to. I you know sometimes it might seem like we're going kind of fast in lecture because we have a lot of material to cover, but this will be recorded and posted and you'll have a chance to watch it as many times as you want. Okay, if there's no questions, I'm gonna let you guys all go and I will see you guys on Monday. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, you too. Yeah, thank Thanks. you.